Hello and welcome to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. In today's video, we are going to unbox, reveal, discuss, and upgrade this Cabaretti Cacophony pre-constructed deck. What's up, MTGBC? That is the MTG Burgeoning community. Here we are about to undergo another liberation of contents from the oppressive packaging of a sealed commander deck. The seal is coming off and the contents will be spilled in three, two... Oh, we couldn't wait that long. It's already open. There it is. Oh, no better feeling then opening up sealed product. Out comes the deck. There it is in the deck box. Out comes the inner packaging and nothing left there. So that goes over to the side to be recycled. We have our Cabaretti logo, little, um, I don't know, counters that we would call, I suppose. And there it is, that sweet, sweet divider that MTG Burgeoning will always have find a use for. Another damaged deck box. Look at this, the quality on these. Boy, I don't use them, so I'm not really complaining, but there might be players out there that would use these to help hold their commander decks. I wouldn't. I mean, this is pretty not sturdy, pretty shoddy, but what are we going to do? It's what Wizards gives us. So there's the deck box. Some additional packaging that goes the way there. Our life wheel. We got our life wheel. We got our how to play magic pamphlet. We have the sweet, sweet collector booster sample pack, which will be meant for a greater purpose. And then we have our wonderful Naya sealed deck. As usual, there are two different commander options for this pre-constructed build. The front-facing general is Kit Kanto Mayhem Diva, a 3-3 cat barred druid for one in Naya colors. When she ETBs, we create a 1-1 green and white citizen creature token. At the beginning of combat on each player's turn, we may tap two untapped creatures we control. When we do, target creature that player controls gets plus two plus two and gains trample until end of turn, and that creature is goaded. And when a creature becomes goaded, it must attack that combat if able, and it must attack a player other than us if able. That is Kit Kanto and Jeff. General option number two is Fabine, Boss's, Boss's Confidant, a 3-6 Cat Advisor for three in Naya colors. Creature tokens we control have haste. This also has the parlay mechanic. At the beginning of combat on our turn, each player reveals the top card of their library. For each land card revealed this way, we create a 1-1 green and white citizen creature token. Then creatures we control get plus one plus one until end of turn for each non-land card revealed this way. Then each player draws a card. For the purposes moving forward with this video and the upgrading of the 99 of this build, we are going to stick with Kit Kanto as the primary general. And for a couple of different reasons, Fabine's, gen F Fabine's mana value of three and Naya colors for a total of six is pretty, pretty pricey for what she does, just giving creature tokens we control haste with the potential of giving them the temporary power and toughness boosts off of the parlay mechanic. And for me personally, I don't want to be the player that is allowing my opponents to draw cards off of parlay activations. I am group slug, not group hug. So we are going to move forward with the understanding that Kit Kanto is the general of this build. This Cabaretti Cacophony deck has a few cards from the Streets of New Capenna in the 99, in addition to several only-to-be-found cards within the confines of that same 99. Here we are going to talk about each and every one of those cards, and we're going to begin with the cards straight from the Streets of New Capenna, 
And the first one is Rumor Gatherer, a 2-1 elf wizard for 1 and 2 white. It has the alliance mechanic, which reads, Whenever another creature enters a battlefield under our control, we may scry one. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, we get to draw a card instead. Because this is a dedicated token build, Rumor Gatherer could be an extremely beneficial creature to get out into play early, mid, or late game. Next, we have Sizzling Soloist, a 3-2 human citizen for three and a red, also with the Alliance mechanic. Whenever another creature ETBs under our control, target creature and opponent control can't block this turn. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, that creature attacks during its controller's next uh, combat phase if able. Not a straight goading because that creature could be coming our way, so that might be something to take a look at when we're talking about keeping Sizzling Soloist in the 99 of this build moving forward. Next, of course, we have the Cabaretti Charm. This is going to be our modal spell at instant speed. We pick one of the following three. This charm deals damage equal to the number of creatures we control to target creature or planeswalker. If only that were to any target or target player, that would have been amazing. Mode 2, creatures we control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until end of turn. And lastly, we get to create two 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens. Cabaretti Charm seems like its modes may be a little bit nerfed for the purposes of this go-wide Naya strategy. And the last card from Streets of New Capenna, it is Cabaretti Courtyard. This is the continuation of cards that are similar to Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse. When this ETBs, we sacrifice it immediately, and when we do, we search our library for a basic mountain, forest, or plains card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and we gain one life. Now you can go and think to yourself whether this is an improvement over Evolving Wilds, Perhaps for the purposes of a color-specific deck such as this one, Cabaretti Courtyard may be superior. However, when thinking about using a card like this in a, in a build that may be more than three colors, that may not be as valuable as just keeping it into a dedicated Naya build. All right, next we're going to go with the cards that were created just for this deck. And the first card is... Boss's Chauffeur. It's an elf citizen with a 0, zero for power touches for 4 and a white. It ETBs with a number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on it equal to the number of other creatures we control. This too has the alliance mechanic. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under our control, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Boss's Chauffeur. When Boss's Chauffeur dies, create a 1-1 one, one white and green citizen creature token for each plus one plus one counter on it. So we want many creatures into play. We want many we want many creatures on our side of the battlefield when this comes into play. And we want this to be on the battlefield when we're making many of those creature tokens because we're just going to continue to cycle through plus one plus one counters and additional creatures. And Boss's Chauffeur could be one of those cards that can really help to strengthen the synergy of the token-wide strategy. <clears throat> Next, we have Grand Crescendo Instant for X and Double White. We create X, 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens, and creatures we control gain indestructible until end of turn. This is just screaming, hey, look, I have no creatures, attack me. Cast Grand Crescendo, give those bad boys all indestructible, and suddenly your opponent is wondering why he or she sent the entire army. Next, we have Master of Ceremonies, a 3-4 Rhino Druid for three and a white. At the beginning of our upkeep, each opponent chooses money, friends, or secrets. For each player who chose money, you and that player each create a treasure token. For each player who chose friends, you and that player each create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. For each player that chose secrets, you and that player each draw a card. This is a political card. This is a card that's going to help other players. For me, this is a card that I am not interested in. I have said many times throughout this series and throughout the life of this channel, I am not group hug. 
I am group slug, so Master of Ceremonies for me is not a card I would consider adding because I do not want to help up, help out my opponents with any of their resources. Next, we have Indulge to Excess, the sorcery part of this on the upfront card. Whenever a creature we control attacks this turn, we create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token that's tapped and attacking. So this could be a very, very powerful and potentially game-ending spell if we have a large enough army to do so. And when this card hits the graveyard, then we can cast Excess, which for one and a red, we get to create a treasure token for each creature we control that dealt combat damage to a player this turn. In a go-wide token strategy such as this Naya build, Excess could give us so many treasures that we could end up completely out-resourcing our opponents and then just outright winning the game. Next card up, we have Life of the Party, a 0-1 elemental for 3 and a red. It has First Strike, Trample, and Haste, and hopefully, and yes, there is a lot more text after that. Whenever Life of the Party attacks, it gets plus X plus so till end of turn, where X is the number of creatures we control. When Life of the Party ETBs, if it's not a token, each opponent creates a token that's a copy of it. The tokens are goaded for the rest of the game. And of course, to go to creature, that means they attack each turn, if able, and they attack a player other than us, if able. So just be careful that it's not just down to you and that opponent, and you're gifting the opponent with this big, huge, potentially monstrous, game-wrecking, ending, and shuffling up your tech elemental, because it has first strike, and it has trample, and its power could end up being very, very big. All right, next we have Rose Room Treasurer, 4-3 Ogre Warrior, 3 in a red, and again has the Alliance mechanic. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under our control, we create a treasure token if this is the first or second time this ability has resolved. Otherwise, we may pay X, and when we do, Rose Room Treasurer deals X damage to any target. So the first time a creature comes into play, boom, treasure. Second time, boom, treasure. Any time after that, we're looking at fireballing at whatever we want. And now we have Seize the Spotlight, sorcery for two and a red. Each opponent chooses fame or fortune. For each player who chose fame, gain control of a creature that player controls until end of turn. Untap those creatures and they gain haste. For each player who chose fortune, we draw a card and create a treasure token. This is the kind of spell I'm talking about. We cast it. We are the ones that benefit from it by either getting a creature for a turn or drawing a card and creating a treasure. Seize the Spotlight is my kind of spell. All right, now we're shifting to mono green. We have Crash the Party Instant for five and a green. We create a tapped 4-4 four, four green rhino warrior creature token for each tapped creature we control. So best case scenario, we're casting this at the end of our last opponent's turn after hopefully swinging out with a very large army taking out one of our other opponents. Next, we have Killer Service. It's an enchantment for two and a green. When it ETBs, we create a number of food tokens equal to the number of opponents we have. So two, three, maybe four. At the beginning of our end step, we may pay two and sacrifice a token. When we do, we create a 4-4 four, four green rhino creature token. So this gives us some food. It gives us some tokens to work with if we don't have any other tokens available. It's a little slow because we can only do it one per round of turns. So this may be one of those spells that we could eye as a potential. Let's replace this with a card that can help synergize our token go-wide strategy a little more. I don't know, a little more effectively. Next, we have Spectre of Celebration and Equipment. It's two and a green to cast and three to equip. Equip creature gets plus two plus so and gains trample. And whenever equip creature deals combat damage to a player, we create that many one one green and white citizen creature tokens. So if we can get this bad boy on a creature big enough, we have a living hive on our hands. And that could really help to squeeze our opponents right out of the game. More and more creatures, the bigger the, our army, the more likelihood we're going to win via combat damage. 
Next, we have Vivian Stampede, a sorcery for four and two green. Each creature we control gains vigilance, trample, and melee until end of turn. Many, many moons have passed since we last had a card with melee on it. And that means, of course, that whenever a creature with melee attacks, it gets a plus one, plus one till end of turn for each opponent we attack this turn. So even if you only send one creature at each opponent, if we have three opponents, each one of our creatures that are attacking, they're getting plus three, plus three. And that just feels good. At the beginning of the next main phase of this turn, we draw a card for each player who was dealt combat damage this turn. Most likely, if we're investing six mana and we're giving our creatures vigilance for the protection of defensive purposes, of course, trample and melee, it seems very, very likely that we're going to damage each opponent who's sitting at that EDH table. So let's face it, we're drawing three cards minimally, as long as we have three opponents, at the conclusion of casting this spell, at the conclusion of our combat, and at the beginning of our next main phase. All right, moving over to the to the multicolor cards, we have Bass Soul Nourisher. Here we have a 1-1 one, one human citizen that's for one in Selesnia colors that reads whenever one or more creatures with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one enter the battlefield under our control, we put a plus one plus one counter on Bess. Whenever Bess attacks, each other creature we control with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one gets plus X plus X till end of turn, where X is the number of plus one plus one counters on Bess. This seems like it is the this seems like it's the let's build it up slowly crater hoof behemoth effect outside of trample still could be effective particularly because of the number of ways in which we can create creature tokens in this deck and amass a massive army. All right, next we have Cabaretti Confluence, a confluence for three Anaya colors. Boy, oh boy, we're investing six mana into this spell. Let's hope that the modes are worth it. Mode one, create a token that's a copy of target creature we control. It gains haste, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Considering what creatures might be in play when we cast this, that might be beneficial enough to just pick that spell, I'm sorry, to just pick that mode three times. Again, that's going to depend on what creatures do we have in play and under our control at the time of casting Cabaretti Confluence. We can also exile target artifact or enchantment. That's not bad at all because, of course, exiling is always better than destroying. And lastly, creatures target player controls get plus one, plus one, and gain first strike until end of turn. All right, so the ceiling on that would be plus three, plus three, and first strike for six mana. Eh, that might be beneficial. I still think the first mode may be the most powerful. We create a token that's a copy of target creature we control, and it gains haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Depending on what the creatures are in this deck and what potential ETB triggers those creatures may have, Cabaretti Confluence might be considered a potential win condition based upon those factors. Two cards left. The next one is Prosperous Partnership. An enchantment for one in Boros Colors. When it ETBs, we create two 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens. We can tap three untapped creatures we control to create a treasure token. So we can ramp ahead of our opponents by getting some treasures into play, but it's going to cost us tapping three of our tokens each time we do so. And the last card for this part of the video is False Floor. It's an artifact for four ETBs tapped. Creatures enter the battlefield tapped. We can tap to tap this and exile it to exile all untapped creatures and activate this only as a sorcery. Okay, so we have a lot to unwrap with this card, but we have very little play experience with which to do it. So this is going to be one of those cards that we're just going to have to test out to see how it works, particularly in a build where, let's face it, we're trying to outmaneuver our opponents and make sure that we can win via combat, having our creatures come into play tapped. Well, we're just going to have to leave a big question mark hanging over the card known as False Floor. Now let's quickly review the reprints that have been included in the 99 of this Cabaretti Cacophony build and see how they synergize with the overall token theme of this deck. 
First card off, great start and tangible virtue. Give those tokens plus one, plus one, and vigilance. All right, we've got the Ors off Advocates. That's going to help synergize with some plus one, plus one counters. That could be something that's beneficial. Oh, love to see a Path to Exile reprint. Very nice. Removal keeps going forward with another copy of Beast Within. That's fantastic. We're in green, so you know we're going to have some ramp. There's Cultivate. Harmonize will draw us three cards. Leaf Kin Druid could help to ramp ahead of our opponents with its mana ability. Same thing with Secure a Tribe Elder being a rampant growth. Wood Elves fetching out ourselves a Forest card. Boros Charm because, well, we're playing red and white. There's our Arcane Signet reprint. Very good. The Bloodthirsty Blade. All right. Equip creature gets plus two, plus zero, and is goaded. Now, goaded, goad is an underlying mechanic in this build that I think we're going to have to flesh out more and make it a stronger presence within the 99 of this build as we start talking about upgrades. All right, Commander Sphere, there's the Falwire Stone. Many moons since its last reprinting, but it seems to always retain its value. Call the Copper Coats, that's from, I believe, the Ikoria, the Ikoria Commander set back in 2020. This will get us some creature tokens as long as our opponents have them. Duelist Heritage, let's make sure we can give some uh, Double Strike out there. Felidar Retreat, because you know we're in green, so we're going to be getting those lands onto the battlefield. We might as well make some tokens and put some plus one, plus one counters on them. Fel the Mighty, hmm, that could be an interesting card to have in the deck. Four and a white, destroy all creatures with power greater than target creature's power. In a dedicated token build, it seems reasonable to think that we will always have such small 1-1-y creatures. However, as we've already seen, we have quite a number of spells and effects that can boost the power and toughness of these creatures. This might be a card that would be better served being replaced by something that could wipe out everything if needed. Martial Coup, there's something similar right there. X-1-1 White Soldier Creature Tokens, if X is 5 or more, destroy all other creatures. We could do that. Agitator Ant, again, there we go with some more Goad. Kazool, if any of our opponents have the Gall to attack us. Excuse me, as I was saying, if any of our opponents have the Gall to attack us, they better make sure they pay 3 for each one of those attackers, or we're going to create Red Ogre Creature Tokens that are 3-3 three, three until the cows come home. Magus of the Wheel, because why not? Wheel of Fortune is way too expensive. Outpost Siege, we're in tokens, so you know they're going to be leaving the battlefield left and right. We might as well play an enchantment by selecting dragons and make sure that we can deal some Goblin Bombardment-like damage. Zerzoth Chaos Rider getting its first reprint. Okay, welcome to the Cabaretti Cacophony. Atrasta is going to help us to make some more creature tokens whenever one of our opponents decides to cast an instant or sorcery spell. Awakening Zone, let's get those Outdrazzy spawns into play. And there's one of our win conditions right there, Beastmaster Ascension. Just turn the army sideways and watch their power and toughness grow 5-5. Champion of Lamb Holt, a fantastically sneaky card that will allow our that will allow our army to attack unblocked if we can get her power big enough. Sandworm convergence with its eight mana value. Oof. It's a big one, and it will restrict creatures with flying to not being able to attack us or Planeswalkers we control. And at the beginning of our end step, we do get a 5-5 five, five worm, but 8 is a lot to invest on something that doesn't happen right away. Might need to take a second look at that card. Scute Swarm, there it is, more tokens. Shamanic Revelation, let's draw a card for each creature we control. Why the heck not? Sylvan Offering, eh, this would come out right away because, again, we are not going to help out our opponents. Thunderfoot Bailoff, let's give all of our creatures plus two, plus two, and trample. Artifact Mutation, some more removal. Assemble the Legion. If this is left in, without any interaction, this is just win the game eventually card. It just really is. Aura Mutation, some more removal. Camaraderie, let's draw some cards and give our creatures plus one, plus one till end of turn. And for the first time, we have Gahiji Honored One in a reprint for the Commander decks. Love to see this card. 
4-4 four, four for two and Naya colors. Whenever a creature attacks one of our opponents or a Planeswalker an opponent controls, that creature gets plus two, plus oh until end of turn. That is the kind of card that we don't mind including that affects our opponents because it gives them nothing but the incentive to crush each other. March of the Multitudes. Let's get some more tokens into play, this time at instant speed. Salvala will come out of the deck immediately because of the parlay mechanic. That's for me. That's a personal choice of mine. You may feel differently. Idol of Oblivion. This is, this is almost an automatic tap to draw a card because we're going to be creating so many tokens. And there is our Soul Ring. And those are the reprints in Cabaretti Cacophony. And now let's take a look at the land base that's been included in the 99 of this Cabaretti Cacophony pre-constructed deck. We begin with three basic plains, three basic mountains, and seven basic forests. As an additional bonus for each basic land type, there is one full art showcase Streets of New Capenna basic land. Here's the plains, bringing our total for plains up to four. Here is the mountain, bringing our total for mountains up to four. And lastly, here's the forest, bringing our total up to eight forests for a total of 16 basic lands. Now let's take a look at some of the dual lands that are that are included in the land base of this deck. We're going to begin with our Selesnia pairings. We have a filter land here that for one colorless mana, we can tap this and then generate a green and a white. We have a Canopy Vista, which is our Selesnian battle land. It will ETB untapped as long as we control two or more basic lands. And lastly, we have Fortified Village, which will come into play untapped if we show a Plains or Forest card from our hand when we put that card onto the battlefield. And for the Gruul dual lands, it's pretty much functionally the exact same as the Selesnian. We have our filter land, one colorless mana for Gruul colors. We have our Gruul battle land, just like, just like um, the one from Selesnia. This will come into play untapped as long as we control two or more basic lands. And of course we have game trail. This is going to be reveal a mountain or a forest from our hand as it enters a battlefield. And if we do, it will come into play untapped. And as a very nice surprise in this deck, we have an enemy filter land for the first time. Rugged Prairie. So nice to see the filter lands beginning to make their presence known in the land bases of these pre-constructed decks. For a red and a white, we'll get two red, two white, or one of each. And we can also turn this sideways for one colorless mana. This is, for all intents and purposes, the only reliable Boros dual land that was included in the land base of this deck. Next up, we're going to talk about some of the lands that were included that come into play tap that I think they would be better served getting replaced as soon as possible. And we're going to begin that discussion with the thriving lands that were included. There's one of each, and each one of them come into play tapped, and they each tap for one mana of their color, one for white, one for green, and one for red. And of course, when each one does ETB, we pick a color other than a color of the mana that it can generate. This kind of acts as a fix-as-we-need dual land. However, they come into play tapped. We seem like we want to build on tempo, so we want to eliminate as many tap lands as possible. For a very reasonable replacement, let's get rid of these three lands and add the appropriate check lands in their place. They will come into play untapped as long as we have the basic land that they're checking for. So, for example, the Selesnian check land of some petal grove will enter the battlefield untapped as long as we control a plains or a forest. First, let's get rid of the thriving lands and put the check lands in their spot. Next, we have Jungle Shrine. It gives us one mana of any color that we need to cast the spells in this deck, but it also comes into play tapped, and I think it would be better served replacing this, if possible, with a reflecting pool or a mana confluence. Same can be said for Temple of Triumph. Yes, this is a Boros dual land, as we mentioned earlier, that Rugged Prairie is really the only reliable one, because this comes into play tapped as well. When it does come into play, we do get to scry one. However, I think it will be better served to try to find a land that we can put into play that will make sure that it comes into play untapped and gives us a red or white when needed. 
When push comes to shove, it may be important enough to add Sacred Foundry, which is the Boros Checkland. And next, we have an interesting conversation to have about Path of Ancestry. This comes into play tapped and does give us one mana of any color in our, in our commander's color identity. However, its scry ability seems like it's not one that we're going to be able to utilize very often. Kit Kanto is a cat bard druid, and this is neither a cat nor bard nor druid tribal build. So for the purposes of this land, it may be more important to substitute this with the aforementioned reflecting pool or perhaps the Mana Confluence, because the, either of those lands come into play untapped, where Path of Ancestry does, and we don't really going, we're not really going to benefit from its Scry Trigger. Speaking of fetch lands that we were talking about a little earlier, it might be important to take a look at the quote-unquote fetch lands that have been included in this build, and that is Naya Panorama. It'll tap for a colorless. We can pay one to tap this to sacrifice it for a basic mountain, forest, or plains and put it onto the battlefield tapped. So there is that. There's also the painfully slower myriad landscape, which comes into play tapped. Does tap for a colorless, but requires two mana to activate. We will use that two mana to tap and sacrifice this land. And we search our library for two basic land cards that share a type. And that's where we get into trouble, because we're trying to fix our mana in a three-color deck. We really don't want to be limited to getting two forests when we only have forests in play. We want to go out there and get a plains and a mountain. So Myriad Landscape might be better off getting replaced by one of the lands like a fetch land, if that is a possibility. And next up we have Ash Barons. This is going to give us a colorless mana, or we're going to cycle this away for one and put a basic land from our library into our hand. All right, the last set of lands we have here, we have a few utility lands and then a couple of studs. We are going to play with a Windbrisk Heights. This has the hideaway mechanic. When it ETBs, we'll look at the top four cards of our library and exile one of them face down, putting the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. This will tap for a this will tap for a white mana. This does enter the battlefield tapped. However, the hideaway trigger is enough to make up for the bet for the risk. I'm sorry, helps to make up for the detriment of this coming into play tapped because we can pay a white and tap this and we may play the exile card from the hideaway trigger without paying its mana cost if we attack with three or more creatures this turn. If we can't attack with three or more creatures during any turn of any game that we play with this deck, then there's something terribly wrong. A wind brisk heights helps to let us cast a spell for free as long as we can get by having a land come into play tapped and I think we can. The risk out, I'm sorry, the benefit outweighs the risk. Next, we have Castle Embreth. This comes into play tapped unless we control a mountain. So this has like a check land mentality that we were talking about earlier, which makes it acceptable to keep in this build. It turns sideways for a red mana, and we can tap one and two red and tap this to give creatures we control plus one plus zero until end of turn. Because of the high volume of creatures we're going to create in this Naya token go wide strategy, Activating this for only one and two red to pretty much make sure that we deliver the lethal blows in combat to win the game makes Castle Embreth one of the sneaky good additions in this deck. And from a utilitarian standpoint, this is the last land we're going to talk about. That is Castle Arden Vale. It comes into play tapped unless we control a plane, so there's that check ability again. We can tap this for a white mana, or we can pay two and two white and tap this to create a white human creature token. Now the two and two white and tapping Castle Arden Vale, let's face it, we're investing five mana because we have to tap the land as well in order to create one human creature token. This land may be better served coming out of the 99 to re be replaced by something that would be a bit more either mana efficient or something that gives us a more favorable um, a more favorable effect maybe something like a Gavany Township. All right in the last two lands two commander staples 
One is the best land in the format as a command tower, and the second is Exotic Orchard, which is a very nice thing to continue seeing its presence in each and every pre-constructed EDH deck. And to wrap up the review of the contents of this Cabaretti Cacophony deck, we will showcase the Kit Canto Proxy card. Very, very nice foiling on that card. Nice and thick cut. Would not be terrible to pull that out of a collector booster or a set booster if that is possible. And next up, we have our tokens. There's our Eldrazi spawn, more Eldrazi, the Cat Beast, a Devil, an Ogre, a Beast, a Tree Folk, an Elf Warrior, a Citizen, and a Treasure. And then on the back side, we have Rhino Warrior, Food, Worm, Spider, Sapperling, Insect Soldier, another kind of soldier, a Human Soldier, and a Human. Wow, look at that. They were all different. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty different creature tokens. Holy mackerel, there should be some kind of mechanic that rewards you for that. And we have our plus one, plus one counter counters that we can push right out. And on the back side, oh, we have goaded cards. There we go. That's very cool. That is a first and very welcome to see, particularly in a deck where I do believe we're going to strengthen that goad mechanic. And lastly, we have popular magic formats. And on the back side... How to take your turn. Cabaretti Cacophony is a token in Naya build featuring the goad mechanic. Whenever a creature is goaded, it attacks each combat if able and attacks a player other than you if able. With this dynamic in mind, the following cards are some possible upgrades to the original deck list, each of which enhances the established theme of this build. For starters, this is a token build, and aside from the obvious expensive enchantments that double our token effects, let's also add a copy of Second Harvest. At instant speed, we can double the number of token creatures we control. This is a potentially game-ending spell that we can cast at the end of our last opponent's turn. Jetmere Nexus of Revels offers varying levels of lordship depending on the number of creatures we control. The ceiling of this card gives creatures we control plus 3, plus 0, Vigilance, Trample, and Double Strike, as long as we control at least 9 creatures. For the investment of 4 mana, this is a very favorable return and easily achievable in the scope of this type of build. If Jetmere is in this deck, then Ginny Fey, Jetmere's second, can't be far behind. Anytime we create a token, we can choose whether or not that token is a 2-2 green cat with haste or a 3-1 green dog with vigilance. These options enhance our token strategy, as many of the token-producing spells and effects in this deck produce 1-1s without any keyword abilities. Goad is an underlying mechanic in this deck that should be enhanced for the purposes of strengthening the overall vision of this build. Disrupt Decorum does this by goading all creatures we don't control. Geode Rager has a landfall ability that goads each creature target player controls whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control. Komainu Battle Armor is an equipment dog. Whenever it or equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, goad each creature that player controls. The Menace ability provides evasion for this creature or the equipped creature, and makes it easier to deal this combat damage. Marisi, Breaker of the Coil, prohibits opponents from casting spells during combat, and whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, we goad each creature that player controls. A large number of various creature tokens should have no problem chipping an opponent for combat damage and then goading all of their creatures. Grenzo Havoc Razor gives us the option to go target creature a player controls whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to that player, or we can exile the top card of that player's library, and until end of turn, we may cast that card and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast it. Grenzo strengthens the gold theme of this build and provides card advantage. Win-win. 
The Enter the Battlefield trigger and attack trigger of Vengeful Ancestor are limited to goading just one creature. However, its ability to have each goaded creature deal one damage to their controller whenever it attacks could be game-ending synergy with the various goad spells and effects in this build. Finally, Master Warcraft, the goad-like spell before goad was a thing, provides a wide range of combat shenanigans from ridding the battlefield of a problematic creature to outright eliminating an opponent. The Cabaretti Cacophony Precon deck features the Naya archetype of go-wide tokens. The reintroduction of the goad mechanic in this build creates the dynamic of forcing opponents into combat with each other, all the time while this build's pilot sits back, amasses a formidable number of creature tokens, and then finishes off their depleted opponents. This deck will not be forced to go too wide because of its ability to make its opponents do a lot of the heavy lifting, making this deck a very entertaining build to consider piloting. 